questions. So thank you. So I would also like to thank the organizers for organizing this nice um, conference. It's fantastic to hear so many different points of view of entanglement. And I think that I would also just like to add another one, which is from quantum information theory. So I would like to talk about multipartite entanglement. And as Mark, I want to give somehow a summary of our work that we did within the last few years. So what we were interested in is what is entanglement, how can we quantify and qualify it, and what can we use it for? Now the reason why we're interested in that, and many of us, is because first of all entanglement has um, some nice applications in quantum information theory, like one-way quantum computing, quantum secret sharing, or quantum error correction. And apart from that, of course, it, uh, multiple data entanglement is very important to uh, understand how a many-body system behaves, especially at zero temperature, as you know much better than I do. So what, uh, what I would like to do is, like what we started when we started working on this project, like six or seven years ago, we went back to the very roots of entanglement theory. So we considered entanglement as a resource theory, and it's a resource to overcome a natural, um, a natural um, obstacle that we have, which is LOCC. So LOCC means local operation assisted by classical communication. And this comes from a very physical point of view where you consider parties that share some entangled state. So you have party A and party B, but they are spatially separated from each other. So they can only apply local operations and communicate classically with each other. And entanglement theory is a resource theory, and this is the limitation that we have. So what we did was to go back to these very roots of entanglement theory and to consider also the bipartite systems and uh, the known results, and this is what I would like to start here with. And what we want to do is to generalize some of these results to the multipartite case. In particular, I want to answer here a very simple question, namely what is the analog of the maximally entangled bipartite state in the multipartite setting? And we will see that you have to consider sets, so these are the maximally entangled sets. And what I want to show you then is how you can actually study general transformations that are restricted to this um, local operations assisted with classical communication. And then ex I will explain why we are actually interested in that. Okay, so let us start with the scenario that I mentioned before. So in quantum information theory, you consider these Alice and Bob. They have now each a particle of whatever dimension, and they share some state, psi, and what I will focus on in this talk is pure states. Okay, so consider here pure state psi. Now, what can they do? Well, as they are spatially separated from each other, what they can do is apply local operations to their systems. And of course, they can talk to each other via the telephone. Okay, so this is what we call LOCC, local operation assisted by classical communication. Now, of course, what they want to do is something fancy. No, they want to do something like teleportation or entanglement based quantum communication. And if they want to do that, they need that this state here is entangled. Okay, so this means that entanglement is actually a resource to overcome this limitation that we have due to the physical setup that Alice and Bob are actually spatially separated from each other. Now, how can we compare two states? So how can we say whether one state is more entangled than the other? Well, so suppose that we have these two teams and now this one claims that this is more entangled than that. So one way that we can decide or could, could look at this problem is to consider certain entanglement measures like the ones that you are very uh, familiar with and use a lot, and say that, okay, well, this measure is larger for this state than for that state. But if we go to higher dimensions, still bipartite, but higher dimensions, then we know that there are measures that are contradicting or giving a different order. Okay, so there are some measures E1 and E2 for which Psi would be more entangled according to E1, but less entangled according to E2. So what we would like to do is to get a partial order that should be independent of the entanglement measure, in the sense that it should hold for any entanglement measure. Okay? And this we can do because, as I said, entanglement is a resource, so the better the resource, the more entangled, meaning that any entanglement measure should take this into account that entanglement is a resource to overcome this LOCC. I will be more clear in the next uh, transparency. So um, resource theory means what? That we have free states and free operations, so whatever we can do with this LOCC, so locally assisted with classical communication, doesn't cost any entanglement. So this is for free, okay? So this also means that if I start with some state psi and I go with LOCC to some state phi, if I can do that with LOCC, this means that this state has to be at least as entangled as this state, no matter what entanglement measure we choose. And in fact, the definition of entanglement measure just has to respect that order. Okay, so entanglement measure for pure states means that any function that fulfills that whenever I can go from psi to phi, it's not increasing. So it's non-increasing under LOCC. 
Okay, now, as I said, this is very, this is very physically motivated in the context of quantum information theory. Okay, and this allows us to give us a partial order between states. So we can get some kind of uh, structure in the super huge Hilbert space that we have and by considering this partial order. Now, as I said, LOCC is very important here because these are our free operations. Now, what are LOCC operations? So physically, it's very easy to explain because it's really what Alice and Bob can do. So Alice can apply whatever generalized measurement on her system, communicates the outcome to Bob. He applies, depending on the measurement outcome of Alice, some operation, communicates the result to Alice, and so on and so on and so on. Mathematically, if you write that down, of course, we have a CP map, CPT map, CP map, um, well, CPT actually in this case, um, which has cross operators that can be written as products. Okay, so this is some operator by Alice, then there is an operator by Bob, again an operator by Alice, and so on. So all these cross operators are local operators, it's an A tensor B. But the problem is that you have to be able to realize that physically, meaning that each of these operators here have to come from a generalized measurement. Okay, so this means that each of these operators has to fulfill the completeness relation that is up there. So this means that if I want to check whether a certain map is LOCC implementable, whether I can really realize it by Alice doing something, communicating to Bob, he does something, and so on, I would need to check whether I can write my map with cross operators that can be written as a product of many, many operators that are first of all local, but second of all, which is much more demanding, that each of these operators fulfills the completeness relation. Okay, so you see that from a mathematical point of view, this is very difficult. Okay, so to analyze that is very difficult. Even more, as we will see later on, it has been proven that for certain instances, you need here infinitely many products. Okay, so at the end, you have to decide whether there exists a factorization of your operators, of your cross operators, into infinitely many operators, which are local, and on top of that, they fulfill the completeness relation. Okay, so this is why I think it's, uh, one can see that LOCC in general is very, very difficult to analyze. The good thing is, that it is a subset of a set of operators which are called the separable operators that, is much, that are much easier to describe because these are simply operators that can be written like that. So our cross operators are local, but they don't obey any additional constraint apart from the fact that the whole map has to be trace preserving. So you have the completeness relation here, but otherwise you don't have any additional constraint on these A's in contrast to LOCC. Okay? Now, being saying that LOCC is so difficult, but you all being completely aware of the fact that we understand pure, uh, pure state, bipartite state entanglement very well, this is somehow looks a little bit contradicting, because if we want to understand entanglement, then we have to study this LOCC if we want to get this partial order. Okay? And also if we want to introduce, for instance, new entanglement measures. So why is that? The reason for that is that in the bipartite case, this complicated LOCC protocol boils down to something that is very, very simple. So in the bipartite pure state transformations, you can show that whatever you can do with this complicated pro uh, protocol of LOCC, you can do it by Alice making some measurement, communicating the result to Bob, and he applies, depending on the outcome of Alice, some unitary. And that's it. Okay, so we don't have to consider infinitely many rounds. We don't even have to consider that Bob makes a measurement. He just applies a unitary. And you can show that for pure state transformations, everything that you can do can be described like that. And of course, these maps are very simple. Okay, and this is also the reason why we understand so well what happens in the bipartite pure state uh, case, how, um, what is a simple criterion for, for instance, to transform one state to another. It just has to, um, it has to be possible to do it with, this, with such a map, and then you can easily find the conditions for when this is possible. This is what is very well, well known as the Nielsen uh, criteria. Also, we can identify the optimal resource, so the maximally entangled state. Okay, for the bipartite setting, meaning really that it's the optimal, it's the best that you can have in this resource theory. And we can characterize also any function that fulfills the same order as given by LOCC. Okay, so again, entanglement measures just have to obey the condition that they're non-increasing under LOCC, which means that whenever I can do such a transformation, my function cannot increase. Okay, but as these transformations are so simple, also this characterization is possible, and this is what is called sure convex function. So this is why we know so much about bipartite pure state entanglement. Now, uh, I guess that all of you would have answered to the question, what is the optimal bipartite state? So what is the maximally entangled bipartite state? I guess that all of you would have answered either phi plus or any 
LU equivalent state to Fe plus. Of course, local unitaries do not change the entanglement, so anything that is, uh, is up to a basis change, a local basis change the same, is equally entangled. Now, what does this mean? It is the optimal resource, it's the maximum entangled state, because from this state we can go to any other state via LOCC. So this means that if I want to do an experiment and I want to have a bipartite system and I want to do whatever, if I want to set up an experiment, what I should do is I should try to generate this state. Because once I have that, I can just do local operation assisted by classical communication that doesn't cost any entanglement to transform this state into whatever state I want for whatever application that I want to have. Okay, so this state is really maximal entangled because it's really the optimal resource. It cannot be better than that. Okay, so from this state you can go to the whole Hilbert space and this is what I tried to indicate here. Now, of course, having the maximal or the optimal resource is very good because it not only simplifies uh, looking at the systems, because you, can, you know that you can do that, but also if you want to identify new applications, this is very useful to have the most entangled state. Right? Because very likely, I mean, if I would know the most entangled state, I just have to consider that state. Because if I want to find some new applications now in a multipartite setting, for instance, I would start out with this state and try to see what I can do with LOCC to realize a certain process, like uh, quantum secure communication or something like that. Okay? So the, the identification of the most entangled resources, of course, um, could be very helpful in finding also new applications. Now, as I said before, Apart from identifying the most entangled state, we also know whenever it is possible to go from a state psi to a state phi. Okay? This gives us this partial order in the Hilbert space, so instead of needing to consider this, well, it gives us some structure in the Hilbert space. Okay? But it's only a partial order, and this is what I want to comment here, because there are pairs of states that are not related via LOCC, so neither in one direction nor in the other. Okay? So this is why LOCC gives only a partial order relating some of the states, not all of them, to each other. However, in the bipartite setting, we have that even though it might not be possible to go deterministically, so with LOCC is a deterministic protocol, I really end up in the state phi with probability 1. I might end up with a state phi, but not with probability 1, but with a smaller probability. Okay? This is what is called SLOCC transformation, so stochastic uh, LOCC. And what this means physically is that I start out with my state psi, Alice makes a measurement, communicates something to Bob, he makes also a measurement, and for some of the measurement outcomes, they indeed obtain the state phi. For some others, they obtain something else. Okay? But at least with some probability, they were able to go to the state phi. Okay, so in contrast to LOCC, which is really deterministic, I want that for all measurement outcomes, whatever Ellis and Bob do, they end up in the state phi with probability 1. Here, I want that they can at least do it probabilistically. Okay? At least with some probability, they can go to that state. And in the bipartite setting, it's very nice because we always have that we can either go in this direction or in that direction with S L O C C. Okay, so probabilistically we can always do that. Mathematically, what it means is that there exist operators, local operators, that transform our state psi with some probability to the state phi. Okay, so we can always find these kind of operators either in one or the other direction. Now what I would like to do now is to generalize what we discussed to the multipartite systems. So first of all, what is the maximum entangled state of a 3-qubit system, or of an n-qubit system? What is it? What could it be? I mean, could it be the GZ? Is it the W? Or what is it? So I would like to generalize that using the same approach as we had bipartite, okay? So as the optimal resource. And I would also like to understand this, this partial order that we get via LOCC. So I would like to know whether this state here is more entangled than that state, according to any entanglement measure. Okay, so I would like to obtain this answer to this question, as we had in the, in the bipartite ca uh, case. Now, as we all know, in the multipartite setting, we do not really, uh, we cannot fully answer all these questions, right? So it's, it's very little known compared to the bipartite case in the multipartite setting. So what is it actually that makes it so difficult? Why is it so, di so different from the bipartite entanglement? Why is there so little known if we just add one more qubit? Okay? So the difficulties are kind of summarized in this transparency. So first of all, as uh, is, is obvious, I mean, we have exponentially many parameters. So if I consider, for instance, n qubits, then of course I have exponentially many parameters in n that describe the state of my system. So we have to deal with this exponentially many parameters, of course, very difficult. Second problem is that we have uh, instances where we can no longer go probabilistically from one state to the other. 
So not even probabilistically. Okay, so there are, the, for instance, the GZ state and the W state um, cannot be mapped with a local operator. I cannot go from the GZ to the W state. Okay, so this means that if Alice, Bob, and Charlie, in this case, are restricted to local, lo local operations because they are spatially separated from each other, they can never transform the GZ to the W or the other way around. Okay, so. This also means that these two states are somehow really living in different worlds. Okay, so they're not talking to each other because I cannot even go probabilistically from one to the other. Okay, so we have to consider these SLOCC classes because it's an equivalence relation as really separated worlds. Okay, so we have to study entanglement within one class and the other class and so on. Now, for two, um, for three qubits, it has been shown that there are only two. Um, classes that have really three-partite entanglement, the GZ and the W. However, for four qubits or higher dimensions, there are actually the infinitely many SLOCC classes. Okay, so this makes it much more difficult than in a bipartite setting. The next problem, which is also a very uh, important problem, is that LOCC is very difficult. It's as difficult as I described at the beginning because there is no trick. Okay, this actually provable, no trick that you can uh, simply write the LOCC protocol as a simple protocol. Okay, in fact, it has been shown that you need infinitely many rounds. Okay, moreover, LOCC is strictly contained in SEP. So the simple characterization of the SEP operations, where our cross operators are simply local operators, is really a bigger set. Okay, so it's strictly contained, LOCC is strictly contained in that set. Okay, so this means that the separable operators, or the separable maps, where we have local operators, cannot always be realized physically, in the sense that I can, might not be able to do that with LOCC. Okay? Of course, it makes it much more difficult, because if you want to get this partial order, we have to study LOCC. It will not be enough to study SEP. Okay? We have to get this partial order. This, we have to use the fact that entanglement is a resource theory, and the free operations are LOCC, okay, just from the physical point of view. So now, what are the consequences of these problems that we have in the multipartite setting? Well, first of all, the fact that we have different SLOCC classes, so that we cannot go from the GZ state, for instance, to the W state, deterministically, means that we cannot have a single maximal entangled state. Okay? So there cannot exist a single state that is the optimal resource, because if you think about it, if there is a single state which I can transform to the whole Hilbert space with LOCC, and I can transform it to the GZ and the W, okay, deterministically, or even probabilistically, then I must be able to go at least probabilistically from the GZ to the W. Okay, as we know that we cannot do that, we know that there cannot exist a single state. Okay, so there exists no maximally entangled three qubit state in the sense that I explained it before. Now, the other thing, as I said, I mean, this LOCC is very complicated, but if we want to get this partial order, we will need to study these LOCC transformations. Okay, so we have to study when, when is it possible to go from some state to some other state. Now, let's, um, I mean, having said that this is very complicated, let's see what we actually want to learn. Because, of course, also in the multipartite setting, we have that entanglement theory is a resource theory, and the free operations are LOCC. But we also know that there are exponentially many parameters. Okay, so I think that there is no point in really understanding all facets of entanglement in the sense that nobody would like, or I, I think that nobody would like to have an exponentially large vector that contains all the information about the entanglement of the system. Because even if you would succeed in doing that, what do you do with that, with that vector for large systems? Okay, so probably what is more interesting is to understand what are the most relevant states. So what is the most entangled state? Can we identify some new applications for multipartite entanglement? What is the partial order of the states? And um, what kind of state manipulations are actually possible? Okay, so I think that already from this fact that we have exponentially many parameters and we know that this implies that you need to have exponentially many entanglement measures, um, I think it's very good to put physics in the, in, into this context and, and somehow admit that uh, even knowing this will probably not be very helpful for what we want to do, especially if you have large systems. Okay, so now, how can we address this problem? So how can we address or identify the most entangled, uh, so the optimal resource or the maximal entangled states? How can we identify the possible LOCC transformations? So the community uses here two approaches. One is to say that LOCC is contained in the larger set, which is the separable operations that are mathematically easier to deal with. And another one is to say that, well, if I would consider to certain kind of transformations in that are LOCC, 
then they are contained in LOCC. Okay, so I consider either the larger or the smaller set of operations. Now this LOCC n is again a physical, uh, has a physical meaning because it means that you consider only finitely many rounds of LOCC. Okay, so I don't consider the infinitely many rounds because again, in an experiment, I would not do that. Okay, so I wouldn't like to implement a protocol that contains infinitely many rounds. So this is why restricting to finitely many might be actually a good idea. And now I will skip basically this, uh, the results that are obtained looking at this problem. I want to focus on that, but I just want to mention one thing um, which is nice and again shows the really the difference between bipartite and multipartite entanglement because in the bipartite entanglement and actually in all previously known multipartite entanglement transformation protocols, you always had the following scenario. You started out with some state psi and you transformed it by Ellis making, for instance, some measurement. Okay, but now she has several measurement outcomes, but the protocols were always such that the, for each measurement outcome, the states were LU equivalent. Okay, so they were the same state. So this means that I go from a state psi deterministically to some state psi one. In the next step, Bob makes a measurement and again goes deterministically to some other state. <coughs> what you can show, however, is that in the multipartite setting, this is not true. So sometimes you really need weird protocols where you have a probabilistic step. Okay, so you have to split. You have to go to some state with some probability and some other state with some other probability. At the end, they go both to the, your final state, but you cannot do it with such a protocol, okay, which again shows somehow the uh, complicated structure of multipartite entanglement compared to bipartite, where you don't need that. Okay, so now let me come back to this uh, inclusion of LOCCs contained in SEP, and what I would like to discuss now is what is the analog of the maximal entangled bipartite state? So how can we characterize the optimal resource in multipartite uh, entanglement? And how can we characterize possible LOCC transformations? So if you, well, the, the way that I introduced entanglement as being a resource, um, if we want to generalize that now to the multipartite setting, and we know that there is not a single state, we have seen already that this cannot be, what we have to consider is a, a set of states, okay? And this is what I call now the maximally entangled set, and it simply has the same properties as in the bipartite case, the phi plus state. Okay? In the sense that from this set, I can go to the whole Hilbert space via LOCC. I can reach any other state in the Hilbert space via LOCC. And of course, what I would like to identify is the minimal set. Okay? And you can easily convince yourself that this is actually unique. So we want to understand now, as a function of the number of systems that I consider, what are the states that I need to be able to prepare in order to get any state in the Hilbert space? Or, is it differently, the, needs that the states that I need to look at in order to identify new applications. Okay? So now, how can we do that? So if we want to do that, of course, we have to study LOCC, right? Because this is the, somehow the, the operations that we are interested in. Um, so the way to do that is to look at Okay, so to identify the possible transformation from one state to another, you first notice that, okay, if this is possible via LOCC, of course it has to be also possible via SLOCC. So if I can do it deterministically, I must be able to do it probabilistically too. This means from a mathematical point of view that there is some so-called representative of an SLOCC class, and there are just local operations that I have to apply in order to get my initial state and also to get the final state. Now, for each of the outcomes in the protocol, this is again the same picture as before. Alice does something, she ends up here, then Bob does something, they end up here or here and so on. But for each of these outcomes, what must happen is that the operators that we apply to our initial state must give something that is proportional to phi. Okay? And if you just rewrite that, so just insert this expression, you see that the local operators that are applied by all the parties are of this form, where this h comes from phi and this g comes from psi, and this s here is the symmetry of the state the symmetry of the state psi zero. Okay, so you just insert these expressions here, then you see that the only freedom that you have, so everything is fixed if you fix psi and phi, the only freedom that you have is the symmetry that your seed state, is psi, state psi zero has. Okay, and this is going to be very important. This is a local operator, okay, so it's simply local operators that leave your state invariant, okay, in GL, so any invertible matrix that is local. And it's going to be very important for what I'm going to say next. Because if you want to study now the larger set, the separable transformations, then Gilad Goa and Nolan Wallach derived some very simple uh, necessary and sufficient condition for when there exists a separable transformation from one state to another, which again involves, of course, these symmetries, these local symmetries. Okay? 
Now, the way we use this result in order to identify the maximal entangled set is to first investigate whether, given a state phi, does there exist a state psi that can be transformed to phi at least with separable operations? Okay, for this we have this simple condition. Of course, if you cannot do it with a separable operation, then you cannot do it with LOCC, because separable operations are a larger subset than LOCC. So this means that if I can prove now that there exists no state psi which can be transformed to phi via SEP, I know that this state phi has to be in the MES, in this maximal entangled set, because it's not reachable from any other state. Okay, so I cannot go to this state from any other state. And so we looked at this um, and, and um, found which states can be reached, and for all the other states we constructed explicitly an LOCC protocol which can transform the state psi into the state phi. Okay, now what are the results? So in the two qubit case, um, at the moment focusing on qubits, we all know that the maximal entangled state is the phi plus state. Okay, so now what happens if we add one qubit? If we add one qubit, we get infinitely many states that are in the MES. Okay, so we need infinitely many states to reach the whole Hilbert space via LOCC. So from a single state, it was the phi plus, to from two qubits, if we go to three qubits, we need infinitely many states. Okay. And uh, with this infinitely many but still zero measure, okay, you can reach the whole Hilbert space. Now, what happens if we add another qubit? If we do that, we get again such a drastic change as from here to here, because what we get is that all of a sudden we have the whole Hilbert space. So what you can show is that for four qubits, the MES, the maximum entangled set, is a full measure in the whole Hilbert space meaning that you need almost all the states in your Hilbert space in order to reach the whole Hilbert space. Okay, so there are very few states that are reachable from some other state. Now, the reason for why this is so is because there is what we call isolation. So this means that if you're given a four-qubit state and you're only allowed to do LOCC, local operation assisted by classical communication, and you want to transform a pure state into another pure state, you cannot do it. So the only thing that you can do are local unitary operations, which I... I mean, excluded here because local unitaries, of course, you can always do that. Right? This is something trivial that can be inverted. So I'm always considering LU equivalence classes, actually. But other than that, you cannot do it. So you cannot transform a pure state into another pure state via local operations assisted by classical communication. And this is why, at the end, the MES, this maximal entangled set, is a full measure in the whole Hilbert space. However, if you again look at those states that can be transformed into something, okay, so that they're not isolated, then you get again a, a zero measure subset, which has a very nice mathematical and physical properties. Okay, so you can really deal with that to study then, for instance, new LOCC protocols, new transformations that you can do, and also possibly some new applications. Now, if you go to higher dimensions, something similar happens, and uh, while you there you have some new insight in the difference between SEP and LOCC. I think I'm going to skip that. What I would like to do next is to talk about arbitrary systems. So I want to change now. We started talking about um, qubits, three, four qubits, and uh, three three-dimensional systems. But now let us talk about arbitrary dimensions. So what can we say there? And what I consider here are homogeneous systems. So systems where I have n d-level systems, but they are all d-level systems. Okay? And I would like to know what are the what is the MES and what are possible transformations. And what one can prove is that for all the systems, the MES is a full measure. Okay, so it will always be the whole Hilbert space. And again, the reason, or the reason here is that generically there is no LOCC transformation possible. Okay, so the reason for this result actually is very different from what I said before, but it's again the same thing that all the states are isolated. So you cannot, almost all, you cannot transform almost none of the states into some other state via LOCC. So this means that the picture looks really like in the four qubit case. Okay, so you cannot do any transformation here. Now, how can we prove that? Well, the way to prove that is to show that the local stabilizer of almost all states in the Hilbert space are trivial. So this means that if you pick a random state and you want to know what are the local operators that leave the state invariant, then you find that it's just the identity. There's nothing else. And because of that, and you recall that if we do this transformation, then you need the symmetries here. Okay? If you have only the identity here, you cannot complete these maps here to a, uh, an LOCC protocol. And this is why you cannot do any transformation. Okay? Um, so 
let me just comment briefly on whether this result is trivial or not. So if you think about this equation, so what we want to find are local operators that leave our state invariant, right? So I want to find these local operators. If I count now parameters, then I see that the number of parameters that I have here are much, much less than the number of equations that I have to solve, right? But, uh, sorry, this is, I don't know what happened here. So this is, of course, two to the n equations, and you have too few parameters to do that. Okay, so you might think now, okay, well, but this is trivial then, because I don't have any solution. However, such a parameter counting argument, of course, just tells you that the stabilizer will generically be finite. So you have only finitely any, uh, many elements. But what we needed to prove in order to ensure that no transformation is possible via LOCC is that it's really trivial. Okay, so that you don't have any uh, symmetry. And this is what allows you to prove that. Okay, so this is now the picture that uh, we have at the moment. So we consider here the number of parties, the dimensions that we have. And you see that um, in this blue area, you, have, you can do transformation. So this is, for instance, the, the bipartite case. So you, your uh, maximum entangled set will not be a full measure. However, the green and the red area, in this case, this maximum entangled set is a full measure. And you can almost never do any LOCC transformation. That is non-trivial. Okay, so this is now very bad news, right? Because we were hoping to be able to identify a set of states that is simple and that would also guide us to new applications. Now, what we ended up with is that if you want to do that, you have to consider the whole Hilbert space. Okay, so this, is, um, this looks very bad now because, again, I'm back to square one. But as we will see, I think that actually this result guides us very nicely to what should be the next steps. But before looking at that, let me just summarize. We, we have seen now that the maximum entangled set is a full measure, that there are almost no transformation possible, and that generically, actually, the SEP, uh, so this, this more general uh, set of operations, is equal to LOCC. And the reason for that is because of, with both of them, you cannot do anything in the multipartite setting. Now, knowing that, one might want to know whether it is possible at least to do some transformation probabilistically. So can we at least say with which probability I can go from one state to another? As we know that we cannot do it deterministically, so I cannot do it with probability one, what is the maximum success probability that I can do the transformation? And also things like when are two states LU equivalent? And indeed one can answer that, and one can give a very simple formula for uh, generic states now, uh, so full measure set of states, um, you can show that the maximum success probability of transforming a state psi to a state phi is given by this simple formula here, where this operator is local. Okay, so for qubits, this means that I have to diagonalize two, by two times two matrices. Okay, so this is something that can be very easily calculated. And um, actually, you can go on. You can also show that two states can be, might be, connectable via a line that we call the optimal SLOCC path. So that's a path that connects the state psi with the state phi, where on each point, the whole thing here is the Hilbert space, on each point I can go from psi to the next state with the maximum success probability and can go on, go on, go on, go on until I'm here. And if I compute the product of all these success probabilities, I have obtained the maximum success probability of going from here to here. Okay, so this is really a path that you can go. You can go to any of these intermediate states and you will always have the maximum success probability. Interestingly, in the uh, multipartite setting, this does not always exist. Okay, so there are instances where you actually have to jump. So there is no intermediate state. There is no path connecting uh, the states. Okay, you can also work with uh, LU equivalence and can show that similar to the bipartite case where we have the Schmidt decomposition and we know when two states are LU equivalent, you can introduce a standard form for generic multipartite states and also have a very simple necessary and sufficient conditions for when two states are LU equivalent, so related by local unitaries. Okay, so now having obtained that the MES is a full measure, is it really useful or, or does it have any meaning to investigate now the convertibility properties of states? So as I know that only a zero measure set of states can be transformed into something else, does it really make sense to look at these transformations? In my opinion, yes, because we all know that the set of states that are considered in a physical context are always of zero measure, right? So we have in quantum information theory, we have stabilizer states that are useful for error correction, one-way quantum computation, and so on. We have hypergraph states, we have in condensed matter, matrix product states, projected entangled pair states, and so on. And of course, they are all of zero measure. Right? This is what you want to have, because you don't want to deal with the exponentially many parameters. And so in the physical context, we always have zero measure sets of states. 
So one thing that uh, is suggested by these results uh, is, in my opinion, that one should study now the convertibility properties of these kind of states to understand better their entanglement transformation, really either from a quantum information theoretical point of view, or one has to generalize the theory because for some of these sets, like the matrix product states or projected entangled pair states, LO makes perfect sense, right? Local operations make perfect sense, but the classical communication might not make sense because these particles are not talking to each other. So maybe one has to generalize that to something else which makes sense in this context in order to analyze whether one can do some transformations or how powerful these states are and so on. The other thing that I think is that, of course, physics also teaches us that LOCC is not the last thing that we want to know, right? So actually, from a physical point of view, LOCC is the first step, and this is also how I see the research so far. Um, we understand now what you can do with LOCC, but what you actually can do in, in an experiment is something much more general. So for instance, you can consider multi-copy scenario. You can consider epsilon closed transformations. So I don't really care experimentally whether I go to the state psi or to something that is close to psi. Actually, I can never go to psi, so <laughs> it's as good as going to something that is close to it. So one should generalize to, to approximate transformation. One should also generalize to going from transformations from higher dimensions to lower dimensions, because I could use a system which is I mean, five level in order to go to a system which is two level, which are qubits and things like that. Okay, so there are many um, generalizations really suggested by physics that I think are the next steps that one should look into. And what I would like to do in the last um, five minutes or so is just to show you some of the results that we have along these lines. Okay. And of course, as I was saying before, the results that I showed you before were just for homogeneous systems, so one also has to, dis to uh, consider the non-homogeneous case. Okay, so when we go to multi-copy LOCC, so I consider now a state psi, but I don't have it only once, but I have it twice. Okay, because from an experimental point of view, if I can generate it once, I can also generate it twice. So I can use two copies of Psi and see what kind of transformations can I do with two copies of Psi. And what you can prove is that the maximal entangled set indeed gets smaller. In the sense that you can show that you can really get here to states that you could not have done with a single copy. Okay, so I can have here some states that are actually in the maximal entangled set. In this particular example, I even get the GHC stat state here and some other state, okay? So then this transformation works. So this means that the MES is getting smaller. And maybe, I mean, okay, so if you go to many copies, so there's an upper limit to the number of copies, which is simply due to teleportation, okay? But maybe you can go below that limit and show that the MES is finite or there are just a few states uh, remaining or something like that. Okay, so this is what we want to investigate further. Now you can also derive results in the asymptotic limit. So this is also from a quantum information theoretical point of view, like the, like the uh, von Neumann entropy, so the entropy of entanglement, has this very nice physical meaning that I can go from many copies of some state to the phi plus state reversibly, and the measure that tells me with how many, what is the rate for that is the von Neumann entropy of the reduced state, so the entropy of entanglement. And here you can do something similar. You can study if I have many, many copies of my state psi, what is the rate to convert to a state phi? And you can give um, a, um, a lower bound for arbitrary states, okay? And again, this lower bound is as before, something that can be very easily computed. Now, something like that was not known so far. I mean, there was one result last year also, um, which holds for three partite systems. Okay, so this is a bound on the rate for three partite systems. However, this here works for arbitrary many systems. Okay, and if you uh, comparing the two, sometimes this is better, sometimes that is better. Okay, so this was asymptotically in the last two minutes I want to use to talk about some uh, research that we did when we want to go from higher dimensions to lower dimensions. I'll explain what I mean by that. So the problem is the following. As I said, we have generically, we have infinitely many SLOCC classes. And as I said before, these classes are not talking to each other. So one has to investigate really each of these classes which is, uh, of course, very difficult because you have infinitely many. So what we would like to do is to group some of the classes. Okay, so I want to say, okay, I don't care about the, the details of SLOCC classes, I want to group some of the classes, classes even in a more coarse-grained uh, view, right? Because SLOCC is already very coarse-grained because it's just probabilistic transformation in contrast to LOCC, which is determinist, deterministic. Okay, so but now I want to group some of the SLOCC classes to get some idea, okay, is, is this state very, very different from this state or is it kind of similar? And we want to do that um, 
from a physical point of view. And the idea was to say, okay, imagine that, I mean, like the GZ and the W, they cannot be related to each other via SLOC, but imagine that I take now some state that is in a higher dimensional Hilbert space. And imagine that this state can be transformed to the W state and to the GZ state. Okay? Now, what I care about is what is the dimension that I have to increase. So here, I mean uh, that I'm increasing the, the local dimension from D to D plus 1. And if I do that, then I see that all these SLOCC classes are actually the same. Okay? So they can be reached from one state that lives just in a little bit a higher dimensional Hilbert space. This can be transformed to all of them probabilistically. So here I'm talking really about SLOCC. However, if I, for instance, these two classes here, okay, for this, to combine those two, I might need to increase the Hilbert space by much, much more than one, okay, the dimension of it. So I'm saying that the, two, the states where the, the increment of the dimension is small are more similar to each other than the one where the increment is, has to be very large. Okay, so this is the kind of, of idea that we wanted to look, look at. And we did that for the simple case of, um, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened here with the formulas, um, of a, a three-qubit, uh, three-partite system um, where you have a single qubit and an N and an M level system. You can study there the SLOCC classes. has been done, for instance, by Eric Chittambar and co-workers by relating that to matrix pencils. And what we looked at is exactly this problem that I said before. And the result that you get is very unexpected, I would say, but as simple as it could be, because you can prove that you only need to in increase the dimension, the local dimension by one, um, so that an arbitrarily picked state, so a state from a full measure set, can be transformed to a full measure set in the lower dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, so this means that generically all the SLOCC classes of this system, of this three-partite system, are, um, can be grouped together by increasing just the local dimension by one. Okay, so this is the smallest dimension that you could increase. And even for this smallest dimension, you can prove that not only there exists one state that can be transformed to all the SLOCC classes, but any state. Okay, so you pick an arbitrary state. Okay, this was pretty um, surprising. Okay, so now let me conclude. So what I tried to explain is that generically there are no transformations um, via LOCC. So this physically motivated definition of, of operations that we are allowed to do that transform one pure state into another pure state, at least in the homogeneous case. This implies that the analog of the bipartite maximal entangled state is a full measure, the maximal entangled set. And the reason for that is that you can hardly ever do anything with one state. So given a state, you cannot transform it to something else. Now, putting these results together with physics, we can analyze now physically relevant subsets, so the ones that are studied in, in many communities, and study what are the entanglement properties or generalize the notion of entanglement to the setting that we, where these subsets of states are actually interesting. Okay, and then of course we should study um, more general transformation than LOCC, like ensemble transformations, or approximate transformations, many copies, non-homogeneous cases, and so on and so on. So I think that with this, I mean, the physics will simply guide us to find new applications, also to guide us how we should actually quantify and qualify entanglement. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and my group members and also all the co-workers, um, which contributed a lot to the work that I explained. Now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. So it's time for questions. So you, measured, um, you mentioned that there is this class of special states in um, arbitrary systems, which are the ones that actually can be transformed into other states. Uh, there's also a, a special class of states in, say, you know, n qubit systems, which are the states that uh, saturate entropy inequalities, like MMI and things like that, or you can think mm -hmm. of them as the ones that live on the edges of the entropy cone, things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of whether those things relate to each other, or more generally, if there's some way to relate, like, um, vectors in, in the entropy cone to the story you talked about? Yeah, so definitely, I mean, there will be a way of doing that. But so in contrast to what you are saying, you're looking at certain, many in this case, but certain entanglement measures, right? And you look at states that optimize these entanglement measures. Now, it doesn't mean that these states also optimize other entanglement measures, right? 
So, um, whereas what I, what I was talking about states that optimize all entanglement measures, any entanglement measure must be in this MES. Okay, there's always states in this MES. Now, of course, in the, in the class of states that you looked at, I mean, depending on which measures you consider, there might be some of them in the MES and some others not. Okay, so one has to look at, uh, at that in detail and, and investigate really particular sets of states to see. Any more questions? Can, can I ask a question? So in, in your final part, you discuss, uh, describe a higher dimensional approach to low, lower dimension. Is, that, is there any hope that we can define single quantity which characterizes multipartite entanglement? For the bipartite, we have von Neumann entropy. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so um, so the, the, the number of, the of non-local parameters that you have scales exponentially with the system size, right? So a single measure, simply because the number of parameters scales exponentially and the local uh, ones that are irrelevant, the LU transformations, these are is, uh, linear in N. So it has to scale exponentially. And uh, um, so in general, it will not be possible to identify a single measure. But of course, if I consider a certain set of states, it might be enough to consider a single measure. Okay? I see. Yeah. Do you have any candidate for such a measure? No, so what we, no, so we have, we have new entanglement measures that have a, a physical meaning, like for instance one that measures how um, transformable is a state, okay, via LOCC, yeah. uh, and things like this. Operational meaning, Is exactly. a simple description in terms of density matrix or? Yeah, some yeah I mean, of some of the measures, some of the measures indeed, they depend on this, on this operator G that I had before that are just products of local operators, yeah. So this can be related very much to the reduced density operator of, um, in the bipartite case. Not exactly, but it can, there is some, some link. So for instance, some measure would be like the, um, the Bloch vector, so the length, the eigenvalues of these operators. Okay, like really the density matrix in the bipartite case. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Any more question? Okay, if not, let us thank the speaker again. Okay.